Are you able to see my presentation? Great. So, hi, my name is Ethan Trejo, and my paper is entitled Fun Home, the Reconstruction of Queer Identities Through Traumatic Memory. Alison Bestial's Fun Home, a family tragic comic, is a graphic memoir that presents Alison's relationship with her father, Bruce Bestial, and explores the sexual and gender identities of both. Allison, a lesbian, is ultimately able to come out while Bruce, a long-closeted queer man, resorts to engaging in closeted homosexual acts, particularly sex with his underage male students. These contrasting queer realities force a traumatized sense of guilt when Bruce is killed by a truck four months after Allison comes out and Bruce is outed. Allison believes this death to be a suicide caused by her revelation and produces Fun Home years later as a means of coping with that traumatic guilt. However, this process of narr narrativization is therapeutic for Allison. It simultaneously makes Bruce's story unreliable in that Allison attempts to define Bruce's queerness through her own differing queer reality. The text was composed to cope with the trauma that Allison endures, trauma born of a complicated relationship with Bruce. It is here that I turn my attention as this queer father-daughter relationship is rife with intersections of trauma and the construction of queer identities. Fun Home is rife with the psychological effects of blame and trauma as intersected with queer identity, given that Allison harshly and fictitiously blames herself for her father's suicide. Blame, therefore, plays a large part in the displacement of trauma onto Allison. She inhibits the hypothetical notion that if I had not felt compelled to share my sexual discovery, perhaps the semi that would ultimately kill Bruce would have passed without incident four months later. The death of a parent is a traumatic event, especially if the child feels at fault for their death. Allison here conflates trauma and blame are as both are associated with her relationship with her father. Michael Richardson notes the inescapability of trauma, as trauma is thus inseparable from the tension between the event itself and its haunting return. It is rather the continual presence of the past in the present, impinging on the future. This notion of blame generates trauma for Allison, as she will carry this blame into adulthood. Allison needs to write Fun Home because she still carries that trauma. She has the need to make sense of her relationship with her father and cope with his death. Yet this blame is not natural, but rather stems from a sense of guilt felt by Allison. Allison is able to come out and discover the joys of an openly queer life in a liberal collegiate atmosphere. Allison reaps benefits in coming out as she is rewarded with a girlfriend and a described sense of belonging within the burgeoning queer rights movement. Yet Bruce is unable to experience the freedom of being authentically oneself, to be openly queer. Allison is never able to explain why Bruce is unable to come out, merely giving the rationale of Bruce living in a, a pre-Stonewall existence and his inability to escape his small hometown. However, despite this insufficient explanation of Bruce's queerness, Allison is aware of the stark difference in these lived queer realities and manifests this difference into blame for Bruce's traumatizing death. The choice to narrativize her relationship with her father is a method of coping for Allison, as my parents are most real to me in fictional terms, as we see in the top right panel. Richardson notes that the transcription of trauma, the act of narrativizing trauma, has the potential not only to narrate what is known and identify absences, but to express the shifting, uncertain, and non-narrative relations between the two. Depicting trauma, therefore, is the act of presenting trauma from a distance, of using traumatic scars in an artistically constructed narrative to explain that which was previously unexplainable. Masking trauma in artistic narratives aids in the construction of trauma's omnipresence upon the subject. As the rupturing of narrative remains, the experience of torture is unable to take place in the past. Allison, by conflating her father's death with her own queer identity, roots her trauma in something that she can never move beyond, generating this omnipresent psychological impact of trauma. Allison is aware of this construction as she states in the top left panel that I'm being histrionic, trying to displace my actual grief with this imaginary trauma. Yet this fictional blame results in actual trauma upon Allison's psyche, resulting in a lack of reliability regarding the depiction of Bruce's queerness 
and the assumed effects of that closeted queerness on Bruce's psyche. If Bruce Bechtel indeed committed suicide, as Allison claims, this suicide likely stemmed from the revelation of his long suppressed queerness that we see in the bottom right panel. Yet we are robbed of this possible explanation as we only learn of Bruce's queerness in the same way Allison learns about it. A phone call from Allison's mother, and Helen Bechtel. We therefore have to trust Allison's account of Bruce's death, an account transcribed by someone who did not witness his death, was not in constant contact with Bruce, and who fictitiously blames herself, at least partially, for Bruce's death. We will never know Bruce's inner thoughts in the final moments before his death. All we can do is trust Allison's depiction of Bruce and his death, which is a flawed narration that overlooks the trauma and actions tied to Bruce's queerness. Allison's depictions of Bruce demonstrate the semi closeted status of Bruce's queerness. Although he never comes out to Allison, she reflects on his behaviors that, when viewed through a lens of psychoanalytic theory, demonstrate Bruce's internalized homophobia and the effects of his suppressed and sublimated queerness upon his psyche. Allison finds in Bruce both a kind paternal nature and a rage-filled esthete that can appear suddenly and violently, equating Bruce with the Minotaur. She describes the traumatic nature of his abrupt mood shifts in the top right and bottom right panels. It, she describes it as it was impossible to tell if the Minotaur lay behind the next corner and the constant tension was heightened by the fact that some encounters could be quite pleasant. Alan Downs notes the connection between rage and shame within queer men, writing that the inhibited emotions, particularly rage and shame, are a major problem for gay men. When we target a range on those around us, we inevitably push them away, creating an environment of mistrust and confusion in our relationships. The connection between rage and shame is prominent for queer men, particularly those who remain in the closet. For Bruce, this tendency to turn to rage upon being questioned or criticized generates traumatic memories for Allison, memories that she must now justify through Bruce's queerness. Allison enables the negative aspects of Bruce's queerness by not delving into the most prominent act of his queerness, his notable sexual relationships with teenage boys. It is noted elsewhere in Fun Home that Bruce has had homosexual relationships with other men his age, notably during his time in the army. Allison also notes that her small town has a gay bar that her father is aware of and seemingly frequents. Yet Bruce, a high school English teacher, still chooses to engage in homosexual acts with his teenage students. Bruce may justify these acts through a lens of artistic and or intellectual value, considering that Allison equates Bruce with Oscar Wilde and Marcel Proust, men who purported the supposed intellectual and artistic value of relationships with younger men. Bruce notes, or Allison notes Bruce's habit of defying the villagers, his most promising high school students. The promise was very likely sexual in some cases. It was young, often straight men with he, with whom he, referring to both Proust and Bruce, fell in love, who would cultivate these young men like orchids. However, the supposed cultivation does not warrant Bruce having sex with underage boys. He is ultimately held unaccountable for these sexual relationships. Allison fails to take a stance on these relationships and merely recollects them through an authorial lens, a fictitious justification of Bruce's actions steeped in a facade of literary grandeur. Allison produces Fun Home as a means of coping with her long-held trauma and presents her family through a literary lens, a medium that makes Allison's family real. Yet, this trauma generates a lack of reliability in the construction of Bruce's queerness, as we can only understand Bruce's queerness through Allison's own vastly different queer reality. Ingrained in this queer narrative is an unwillingness to make Bruce accountable for his actions, as it's hard for me, Allison, to sustain much anger at him. I expect this is partly because he's dead, unquote. Although this process of narrativization is indeed therapeutic for Allison, this narrative born of trauma fails to delve into the relationship between Bruce's queerness, his actions, and the effects of those actions upon his family. The relationship between Bruce and Allison, therefore, demonstrates the complex intersections of trauma and queerness as the construction of both Allison and Bruce's queerness, as narrativized by Allison, is molded by the trauma that connects their stories. Thank you. <laughs>